mentioned, Autumn Quixote, our, 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 one of our board of directors, will be introducing Paul Gray. Autumn, take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce Paul Gray. He's a science coordinator for Audubon Florida's Everglades Restoration Program. Um, and he's been working here in Florida for uh, the last about 30, more than 30 years, right? But the last 28, he's been working with the Audubon. And there he works on water, land, and uh, bird management issues, mostly related to Lake Okeechobee, but he works on statewide issues too. Um, but really importantly, the work entails representing Audubon in public and private meetings and helping to develop Audubon oral and written comments on policy and technical issues, which is super important. Um, he's also a charter member of the Florida Grasshopper Sparrow Working Group, and he's the former co-chair of the Snail Kite Coordinating Committee. Um, he has a BS from the University of Missouri, an MS from Texas Tech University, and a PhD from UF. Um, and so now, without further ado, here is the awesome Dr. Paul Gray. Thank you, Autumn. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Let me share my screen here. Okay. Okay, so can you guys see this? Yes, Paul. And you can hear me just fine, I guess? You're brilliant. Okay, yep. thanks. Okay, well, thanks so much for having me, everybody. Um, uh, I usually talk about Okeechobee and all the problems we have, and I will get to that in this talk, but um, this talk kind of has three parts. Um, one, one, I'm not a historian, but I'm really am interested in, in how people discovered birds in North America. And if you think about, you know, when we go bird watching, we have a, a pair of really good binoculars and, and we go out and we see something and look at it. And then we whip out our field guide and identify it. It's a such and such. But when the first people got here, they would see something and they didn't have a good pair of binoculars. So they couldn't see it very well. And they didn't have a field guide because no one had really cataloged American birds. And so how we figured out what was here was this kind of an interesting story to me. So I'm gonna talk about that early on in the talk. And then I'll talk about the bird <clears throat> conservation movement that arose. You know, we shot out the passenger pigeons and we shot out the Carolina parakeets and we slaughtered the bison and people started realizing that North America's resources were not inexhaustible. And out of those events came the Audubon Society. They were formed around the late 1800s and early 1900s. And so I'll talk about Audubon in general and what they were trying to do early on. And then I'll talk about the Lake Okeechobee program. We hired our very first Audubon warden on Lake Okeechobee in 1936. And I essentially have that position now. So our program's 87 years old. So, and I'll, I'll try to talk about what, what the issues are now and what we're doing. So anyway, with that. Okay. So um, when, when the uh, Columbus discovered America, you know, quote unquote, uh, it, the, the sailing ships always had technical people on them. And it wasn't an accident. You know, when Darwin was on the Beagle, he wasn't on the Beagle because he was trying to study evolution. He was on the Beagle. He was actually a geologist. And he was... Um, he was on that ship because he was supposed to catalog what they found when they traveled around. And mostly what they were looking for is how is are there things there we can make money off of? I mean, are there good soils we could make farms? Are there forests we can cut down? Are there minerals we can go mine? Who are the people that are there? How are we going to have to deal with them? And so all these ships had naturalists on them, and, and Darwin was one of them. And they were just trying to figure out what was in the world because Europe, especially back then was really shocked by how big the world was and how many different things were in it. And so some of the earliest things, these are from 1590s. Um, Sloan uh, put out some, some drawings by John White in, in like 1590. Um, and he only he only drew about 32 birds. Um, he was in the in the Carolinas, you know, the Virginia, the Carolina area. And then Top Cell, he never even came to the, the United States. He was British and he just copied uh, White's pictures and, and so you can see that he, he pretty much drew the same bird again. Um, John Lawson in 1709 tallied 129 species, but he just had a written narrative. And so his work was very highly valued because he was a very good descriptor of what was in, in the Americas, but he didn't, he didn't make pretty pictures. And, okay. 
So the first person who really made a, a good book about North American wildlife was Mark, Mark Catesby, and that was in the mid-1700s. And notice he only illustrated 109 bird species, which is less than what Lawson had. But this was the first time that someone really put together a pretty good book of, of North American birds and plants, and he, he did fish and other things. Um, and, and it really got a lot of attention in Europe. And back then, you know, printing was very primitive. Um, these, these images were, you had to do etching processes where you would make a, a, an etch in, in some kind of a plate, either a wood block or they had a, some metal etching. And then you'd have to sit there and hand color every single print in every single book. And so it took him 20 years to make his book, but he was had the first really nice renderings of North American wildlife. And of course, you all know that this is a belted kingfisher. Um, here's a Carolina parakeet. Uh, an interesting thing about Catesby is he named all these birds with scientific names, but he would use like four different scientific terms. And it was Carl Linnaeus who was working roughly the same time that took his books and gave him the, the binomial, the genus and species, and is now the standard. And so Linnaeus gets credit for naming all these birds, even though Mark Catesby was the first one to document them well. Um, he did name the bullfrog uh, Raina catesbyensis, so there is a, a an animal in North America named after him, but, but basically Linnaeus kind of stole his thunder, except for these beautiful illustrations. But back then, it was mostly Europeans and, and their knowledge, and, and in America, we didn't really have a whole lot. And so this guy, George Louis Leclerc, he was French. Um, he... Um, being French, uh, he, uh, he thought everything in France was was perfect, and everything else in the world was kind of degenerate compared to what French French stuff was. But he was actually a master cataloger, and so when people would come back on the sailing ships and they'd have specimens of all this stuff, he would catalog them. But his his disadvantage was frequently they were mislabeled. He didn't necessarily even know what continent it came from. He he had some pretty big blunders. Um, he would get these skins, and you notice there's no soft color in, in this black skimmer. He didn't get to see the bird in its natural habitat. He didn't see their postures. And so even though he cataloged a lot of stuff and he had very useful work, um, he, he, he had a lot of mistakes. And so um, the next guy to come along that really, really shook up um, the ornithological world in America was Alexander Wilson. And he's called the father of American ornithology. And of the 268 species that were in the areas of the U.S. that he was able to travel, or of the 348, he got 268 of them. And Wilson was just remarkable. He um, was Scottish. Uh, he had trained as a weaver. He had to leave Scotland because he got in some political trouble for writing uh, bad things about some people that were powerful. Um, and he came to the U.S. and he just worked on this on the side. This was just something he decided he was going to do in ornithology of North America. And so he set out and made these beautiful plates. And here's here's the Florida grass. Well, here's a grasshopper sparrow. And I had to spend a lot of money to buy this plate. This is actually out of his original book. And he probably hand painted this, this print because of these gaudy birds up here. But anyway, <laughs> I got my grasshopper sparrow. So Alexander Wilson, and he would write he, he put his, his book out in about 14 um, different uh, installments. And, and what he would do is he would sell the first installment and then he would use that money to make the second one and he'd use that money to make the third one. And anyway, so he just really did a, an astonishing job on North American birds. And Wilson really hated Buffon <laughs> because he thought American birds were just fabulous. And and for, for Buffon to in, be insulting American birds and saying they were inferior to European birds really irritated him. And as a matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson, when he was over in France with Benjamin Franklin, and they were, you know, during the Revolutionary War, and Jefferson was mad at him too because they, the French were what they were, and so Jefferson had a guy shoot a moose and send it over to France to show them we have a bigger ungulate than they do. So anyway, this is kind of a thing going on. But so if you notice, Wilson had the advantage of of habitat. He he knew what the soft colors were because he would shoot the bird and then he would immediately paint it, and one of the things that he did was, this is in the corner of that skimmer. Um, this is down here. Well, maybe not, maybe it's down here, but anyway, this is in the corner of his drawing, Drawn from Nature by Alexander Wilson. And so he was differentiating himself from Buffon and, and pretty much all the Europeans who had described American birds. And, and so he made the first really good bird book of America. And it was so good that, um, a lot of Europeans are like, man, you know, he, he wrote a better book about 
American birds than we even have for European birds. And at the time this book came out, some people thought it was the best scientific treatise out of America, period. Um, and, and he did things like the Orioles. If you think about trying to figure out Orioles, you know, there's a Baltimore Oriole and they have a females one color, the males another color, and then the first year males a different color, a different pattern, and then they molt between their different plumages. And so the taxonomy of the time was all confused and they had like 10 kinds of Orioles and all this kind of stuff. And Wilson actually kept them in pens in, in his room and, and followed them through their molts and was able to sort out the Orioles. And so he just made a lot of advances that, um, that other ornithologists couldn't make. And so you might be sitting there wondering, you know, who is this, who is this Wilson? I mean, I haven't even heard of him, but yes, you have, because what kind of warbler is, oh, whoops, that's not Wilson's warbler. Here we are. What kind of warbler is that? A Wilson's. What kind of plover do we have? Wilson's plover, Wilson's snipe, Wilson's phalarope, Wilson's storm petrel. So there are more North American birds named after him than any other person. And partly it was in tribute to him really putting out a good, credible, solid book that um, not only identified the birds well, but, but had good natural history about them. And so this was in the early 1800s. Well, along comes John James Audubon and 20 years later. And Audubon and Wilson actually met briefly um, in Wilson's travels, but Audubon um, drew these big flamboyant, beautiful birds um, that really captured the imagination of people back then and, and still captured them to this day. And so he became the next famous bird person. And his book was enormous. This is this is the size of the book. So this isn't, you know, a field guide. And what he wanted to do is draw all the birds life size. And so he had to make it this big. And if you look at a lot of his great big birds like pelicans and storks, they're all convoluted on the page because he was trying to fit the real size of that bird on this page. And for a big bird, he had to put him in funny poses. And Audubon was a great artist, but his science was not always that great. And so, but he's, he's iconic and, and obviously the Audubon Society is named for him. And like all the people back then, uh, there was a lot of plagiarism because Audubon wanted to match Wilson's work. And so there were some birds that he could not find and draw independently. So if you look at Wilson's uh, kite and then um, Audubon's kite, they're pretty much the same bird. So he had to plagiarize a little bit of Wilson's um, just to fill out his book and make sure he had equal footing. So after that, in the 1950s, um, we started getting a lot of ornithologists and, um, and it became a, an age of hyper taxonomy where people were trying to identify all these birds and, and looking at minute detail and trying to figure out the difference between you know, all these different birds. And um, basically they were shooting them. Uh, the, in order to really examine them closely, you had to shoot them. And it's, remember, they didn't have very good optics. And so it was kind of a, an age of shotgun ornithology from like 1850 to, to the year 2000. And so these are kind of some historic guns that, that were used. This is a flintlock um, rifle. And um, this is the kind of gun that Audubon shot. This is the kind of gun Alexander Wilson shot. And it's one of those ones where you have to pour the powder in, then you pour a patch in, then you put in your charge and you have to seal it. And then you, these flints snap and they, they ignite the powder in the pan. And anyway, so they were difficult to shoot, but they were pretty effective. Um, in the 1850s, they invented this. This is basically a, a, a regular double barrel shotgun that we think of today and they started making cartridges where the powder and the charge and, and everything was already in it and this gun breaks in the middle just like a regular shotgun and and it was a real innovation in its shooting. Um, this little gun is called a Flaubert and it's it's French um, and it was a parlor shooting gun and the reason this gun is important is because it shot these little caps and they were very very weak and this was actually a gun that people would give to their kids because it was not a lethal gun. <laughs> they couldn't hurt themselves. And, and actually, uh, Herbert Stoddard had one when he was a kid. No, oh, uh, G Gilbert Pearson, and he hated it because you had to be like 10 feet from the rabbit or you couldn't kill it. But this was a kind of gun that was used reportedly by Cuthbert when he shot out the Cuthbert Rookery down the Everglades. And the reason they liked that, this little gun, is because it was quiet. It didn't shoot very hard. And so you could walk right up under the bird shoot it, the gun just goes snap, and it doesn't scare the birds away like, you know, these big 
barrel shotguns, you know, they go boom and everybody flies away. So you can walk through a colony and work your way through there and shoot out all the birds with this little type of, of little bear. And then this bottom gun is called a marble game getter. And this stock folds up and this barrel is 15 inches long. And so when you're traveling, you could take this little gun along and the top barrel is a shotgun. Well, it's 40 caliber. So you can shoot a 410 shell out of it, or you can shoot a 40 caliber slug. And they say you can shoot a bear with this gun, but I wouldn't try that. And then the bottom barrel is, is a 22, which is a small rifle. So Herbert Stoddard carried this around when he would travel because he worked for museums and he always wanted to get specimens. Um, I had to get a special permit to get this gun because the top barrel is only 15 inches long and that makes it technically a sawed off shotgun, which were outlawed in the 1930s when they were having prohibition and they were trying to stop, you know, everybody running around with Tommy guns and sawed off shotguns. So anyway, these are kind of some of the historical guns. And it's funny because we have things that um, come from these guns that most people don't realize. And so if you think about, this is called the lock. And this part back here is the stock and right here is the barrel. And so the lock, stock and barrel saying that we have means you got a whole gun there. You know, you don't just have parts. And that's a phrase that comes from this gun that was used 200 years ago. Flash in the pan, see this little hole right here? This, this, this little tray is called the pan and you put gunpowder in it. And when you, when you snap the gun, um, the spark goes in the pan. And if the pan doesn't go down that hole and shoot off your gun, then you just get a flash in the pan. You don't get a shot off, you're just a flash in the pan. So that's where that came from. And then these hammers, if you cock them back halfway, they won't fire. You got to cock them back all the way. And so if you go back half cocked, that means that you're not ready to fire. So these guns, we, we have sayings that people use all the time, and they came from this individual gun. And well, let me back up for a second. And there's another funny thing that happened back then, too. Um, Spencer um, Fullerton Baird, uh, no, no, wait, Seahart Merriam. Um, he worked at the Smithsonian and he worked his way up to be the curator of birds and mammals. And um, he lived in Washington, D.C. because he was at the Smithsonian. And he was married to the daughter of the Army's Inspector General. And this was in the 1850s. And what he did was he convinced the Army's Inspector General to train his surgeons to collect birds and mammals and other specimens and send them back to the Smithsonian. And remember back in the 1850s, um, there were a lot of, we were sending uh, soldiers out to, out west for, for Indian control and things like that. And when you were in an outpost out west, it was just boring as all get out because you just sat around all the time. And so these guys, especially the surgeons, they would get trained in collection. And so that's how they'd pass their time. They'd send all these specimens back to the Smithsonian and we would learn what was out west. And so as you all know, you know, there's been a, a discussion about whether the Audubon Society should carry John James's Audubon's name because he was a slave owner. And there's also a debate in the American Ornithological Society about the names of a lot of birds because they were named after Confederate generals. And if you wonder why would anybody name a bird after a Confederate general or even a general in, at all, it's because a lot of the most prominent ornithologists of the 18 the late 1800s were, were in the army. And so they would name birds after their friends. And, and when the Civil War broke out in the 1860s, some of them fought for the South and some of them fought for the North. So that's part of the reason why we have this legacy of these names. And you're like, why would anybody name a bird after that guy? It was because of, of Baird and, and his army surgeon uh, ornithologists. Okay, so <laughs> this guy, Joseph Batty. I'm going to talk about him a little bit because he's kind of emblematic of a lot of the people working in the bird trade back in the 1800s. For one, he wrote this charming book called Practical Taxidermy and Home Decoration um, it, by Joseph Batty. And basically what he, he wrote in this book is, you know, now that we're getting a lot of leisure, and this is 1880 uh, in, in America, that, that people can, can put stuffed animals in their house and, and adorn them with, with natural history items. And so this book is about how to catch things and how to preserve them. And you know, what fireplace mantle doesn't look more beautiful with a pair of Orioles mounted on it. Um, so anyway, he was a very competent um, hunter and taxidermist. And he wrote this book so you could decorate your home. Um, and that was a picture of him in the picture. During the Civil War, he actually made these powder flasks for the Union Army. 
And these are made out of bronze because you don't want anything that's going to cause a spark when you're trying to handle your gunpowder. So anyway, um, the Audubon Society got, got founded partly because of the plume bird trade. And people were horrified that these beautiful feathers were being, these birds were being shot and, and used to adorn hats and other types of clothing. And so Frank Chapman, who we're gonna to get to in a minute, um, wrote a lot. He was a very prominent ornithologist in the 1800s and, and was very prominent in the founding of Audubon. Um, and he wrote really good books, the, some of the most current information we knew about the plume birds. And this is about the snowy egret. And here's what he wrote. I mean, usually you write, you know, this bird eats frogs or nests in trees, but he wrote, the curse of beauty has numbered the days of this most dainty and graceful of herons. 20 years ago, it was abundant in the South. Now is it a rarest of its family. The delicate aigrettes, which it donned as a nuptial dress, were its death warrant. Women demanded from the bird its wedding plumes, and man has supplied the demand. The Florida herons have gone, and now he is pursuing the helpless birds to the uttermost parts of the earth. Mercilessly, they are shot down at their roosts or nesting grounds. The coveted feathers are stripped from their backs. The carcasses are left to rot, while the young in the nest above are starving. But then, you know, the little bunch of aigrettes in yonder jaunty bonnet is so pretty, so becoming. I mean, he was really mad. And so anyway, this was, you know, people were just really indignant that we were just slaughtering birds and just putting their head, their feathers in a hat. And this was part of what Audubon was about. And so here's a scientist not writing a scientific paragraph. He's writing, what we're doing is bad. And so the first time there was an Audubon Society, it was George Bird Grinnell. And he was the editor of Forest and Stream, which now is Field and Stream magazine. And he was tutored by Audubon's widow, uh, Lucy Audubon. And so when he decided he wanted to make a nature aware and preservation group, he, he named it after John James Audubon. He called it the Audubon Society. And he started putting out pamphlets for kids. And within four years, he was mailing out like 50,000 pamphlets. And it just got to be too much. And so he quit doing it. But that was the beginning of the idea of naming societies after John James Audubon. And so the people who really um, helped form Audubon were, were Frank Chapman. And remember, I talked about him. He was a, a scientist at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And he was a scientist, but he cared about these birds. And T. Gilbert Pearson, who ended up being Audubon's second president. Our first president had a stroke, and he was so beloved that Pearson took over as president, but, but he wasn't president for 10 years until the former president died. But anyway, I'll talk a little bit about these guys and, and their contributions. So we didn't like the slaughter of birds um, and we wanted to stop it. And there had been different types of laws and things passed to try to protect birds, but they were pretty much not very effective. And we had different laws. You know, We passed the plume bird law in the 1870s. Um, they passed laws to protect birds, but, you know, they had problems like they said, okay, you can't shoot cardinals. And so someone would go out in their yard and shoot a cardinal and you say, hey, you're not supposed to shoot that. And they'd say, well, I didn't shoot a cardinal. I shot a red bird. And so the, the names weren't standardized. And so you can make a list of names, but then everybody had different names for all these birds, especially locally. And so it was really hard to enforce laws like that if you could get anybody to even pay attention to it. And so the American Ornithological Union made what they call a model law. And what they did was rather than try to name the birds you can shoot, they, you cannot shoot, they named the birds you can shoot. And what it was was basically people traditionally hunted waterfowl, ducks, geese, and swans. And we hunted the, the gallinaceous birds, uh, turkeys and quail and partridge and grouse and stuff like that. And then there's a couple other things like cranes or, or doves that, that got put on different lists. But so they made it the model law. They said, okay, we're going to protect these birds. We're going to have seasons and limits on these birds. You can still hunt them, but we're going to try to protect them and make sure they're not shot to oblivion. But all other birds, if they're not on this list as something you can shoot, you, they're off limits. And so that was the AOU model law. And Pearson, in his role for Audubon, went around to all these different states. And in 1901, he came to, to Florida. He introduced the Audubon model law to the Florida legislature, and it got adopted. And when you read Pearson's memoir, he went, 
you know, he writes, well, I went to Florida and I got adopted and I went to North Carolina and I got adopted and I went to Virginia and I got adopted and I went to New York and I got it adopted. And I'm thinking, how in the heck could this guy who was admittedly kind of socially awkward just walk into a state house and get them to adopt a law like this? And so I was really mystified by how that worked until I read Leslie Kent Poole's book, Saving Florida. It was women. Um, that basically Clara Domrich was a founder of the Florida Audubon Society. She lived in Orlando. If you've been on Domrich Drive, her husband was a very wealthy person. And so back then in the 1900s, um, women were frequently educated, but they couldn't vote and they were not encouraged to work. And so you had these smart, well-connected women who were upset about the, the bird slaughter. And so when she called the first meeting, she had Teddy Roosevelt was, was an Audubon Society board member. Um, the president of Rollins College, uh, you know, her husband was a, a major uh, industrial and agricultural guy. And basically, her board was just a who's who of Florida politicians. And so when Pearson showed up, what he didn't mention in his book was that Clara had already taken care of it. Well, she she actually passed away shortly thereafter. But but the Audubon Society, which was largely a woman's movement, but they would have men be their front because, you know, of the way women were treated back then. Um, they were really the backbone of the early Audubon movement. And so here's a picture of Frank Chapman. This was in the AOU. Um, and here he is showing up and he's got all of his women behind him. And so people were recognizing this, that, um, that women were very powerful in the early bird protection movement. And I mentioned Alfred Newman. See this little guy right here? This is, this is, <laughs> this, picture let's see i've got a banner up here well this picture was from oh sorry this this illustration was was from yeah 1901 and and in 1954 this little guy kept showing up in different kinds of ads and caricatures and mad magazine founder adopted him as as alfred e newman and and so people know of him but i was looking at this picture going that looks like alfred e newman so anyway he's been around longer than mad magazine and he was at hanging out with Chapman. And not only in America were we fighting to save birds, but in England, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds also was putting out different kinds of propaganda and they called this a killing hat and just trying to make fun of women and just try to make it unfashionable to be wearing. So not only we were trying to pass laws and get protections, but we we're also trying to get public sentiment to say this is not okay. And so here are some, some herons that were shot by W.E.D. Scott. William Earl Dodge Scott, he was uh, from Princeton. And he came down to Florida. He shot these on Lake Panasofsky. Um, and Scott, and he also shot 40 snail kites while he was on that lake. And, and basically the reason he shot so many is you want to get a series to see the variation in plumage, but also uh, museum people are kind of like collectors. They, they trade stuff. So he could talk to somebody in another state and say, I'll send you two snail kites for three of whatever, you know, so. But W.E.D. Scott was the guy who came to Florida in the 1860s, right after the Civil War, and documented the plume bird colonies around the southern part of the Everglades. And they may have been the largest nesting colonies in the world of plume birds. Um, and, you know, the description is black in the skies and a million or, or whatever, um, just this astonishing abundance of plume birds. And that's, of course, in the 1800s, we hadn't been able to do much to mess up the Everglades. So they were extremely abundant. And Scott came back in the 1780s and went around the same areas and the and the colonies were pretty much gone they'd all been shot out and so he he was one of the first people to really document hey guys you know we got a problem down here in florida and when he was in fort myers he he heard that there's a, a plume hunter shooting outside of town on the sandbars because they also shot shorebirds and other things and so he went out there and the guy was none other than joseph batty the guy that wrote that taxidermy book and Scott sat there and shot with him and Batty told him he said well yeah I've got 60 gunners along the Gulf Coast and they send me birds and I send them to the different uh, millinery houses and, and so that's how he was making his living and the photo we saw of Batty was from the American Museum of Natural History who later hired him to go to South America and collect birds and mammals and stuff and apparently while he was down there he ended up shooting himself and, and fatally and, and died and so his obituary is in the ornithological journals, and it said he was a great guy, and we realized he was involved in the unfortunate plume business for a while, but when he worked for us, he was really great. 
And it kind of illustrates that there are a bunch of different ways people were shooting birds and for different reasons and in different amounts, but it was a kind of an interconnected community of people doing stuff. And of course, plume hunting wasn't the only atrocity going on. Uh, there was market hunting, especially on the East Coast. Um, here's some of these big punt guns that they would go out at night and they'd flush the birds and you fire through the flock. And, you know, if you're shooting for market, you want to take in 100 birds and sell them all. Um, look at the size of this gun this guy has. And he called it his headache gun because he took two aspirins before and two aspirins after firing it. But anyway, so they were shooting all these birds. And so waterfowl were getting slaughtered. And of course, the, the Labrador duck went extinct. And so um, Chapman was still at it. He, he wrote this book called Camps and Cruises. And, and he said, of these birds, herons, egrets, ibises, spoonbills, and others, the state of Florida once possessed a marvelous store. But be it said to Florida's everlasting disgrace, that until the honorable industry of shooting birds at their nest became no longer profitable, she raised no hand to save herself from being despoiled of this rich heritage. Even then, the passage of laws was secured only through influence from without. The laws, however, were not observed, and all efforts to conv secure conviction under them failed. And so what he's talking about is, you know, there's a lot of Easterners, and, and especially New Englanders who were telling Florida, you got to stop this. And of course, Florida was making money off it. Um, even the Indians would bring in plums because they could trade them for guns and things like that. So it was locally profitable, but, but unacceptable nationally. And so we couldn't get anybody to enforce the law. So that's back when Audubon started hiring wardens. And so we would hire them, the state and feds would deputize them, they would enforce laws. And you guys have all probably heard about Guy Bradley. He got killed by plume hunters while he was in Florida Bay around the year 1900. Um, Columbus McLeod, our, our warden over in Sarasota County, um, he, he disappeared. No one ever found him, but they found his boat and his blood in the boat. And um, we had a warden who was shot on Orange Lake up near Gainesville. He didn't die from the wound, but he was shot. And then we had a, a warden in South Carolina who, who got shot and killed. So this was difficult business and we were hiring people to do it. And one of the wardens, um, Paul Krogel, who was the first warden at Pelican Island, uh, he got charged a salary of $1, $1 per month uh, to guard Pelican Island. And um, here's the Pelican Island diorama up in the American Museum of Natural History. Frank Chapman loved Pelican Island and he was friends with, with Theodore Roosevelt. And so that's part of the reason why Pelican Island became the first national wildlife refuge. And um, Paul Krogel managed it and, and managed not to get shot. And at the same time, we're trying to say it's bad to shoot birds. We were also trying to justify uh, the value of birds. And so, Useful birds and their protection by four bush, economic value of birds. This is an old Florida Department of Agriculture book that has a chapter in it called Stop Shooting Your Friends. Um, and we were trying to say, you know, birds are, are can help you. They, they eat noxious animals, they eat weeds, um, they eat bugs. And so, you know, birds are not necessarily bad for you. As a matter of fact, they can be very useful. And and while we were trying to defend the birds, I'm going to go back to Chapman again. And he, he's talking about when he was over at uh, uh, the Sebastian River. And uh, he said, a flock of these birds feeding among the thistles is the most beautiful and animated sight. One is almost persuaded, almost persuaded not to disturb them. There's constant movement as they fly from plant to plant, or when securing thistles, they fly with them in their bills to a neighboring tree there to dissect them at their leisure. The loud rolling call was apparently uttered only went on the wing, but when it rests or feeding, there is a loud conversational murmur of half articulate querulous notes and call. So Chapman's sitting there on the Sebastian River looking at some of the last Carolina parakeets that were still around. Let's see here, here's the label. Carolina parakeet, Sebastian River, Frank Chapman, March 15th. So he shot them anyway. Um, and he wrote in his notes, you know, I really felt bad about that. And if I see some more, I think I'll let him pass. And then he actually did end up seeing some more and he shot them too. And part of what he called them was feathered documents that um, had he not shot these, these birds and gotten their skins, and I think he got a skeleton, we wouldn't have them. So again, he's trying to save these birds, but then he's also shooting the last ones. That's kind of some of the conflicts that we saw with early shotgun ornithology. 
And so, and I think Richard Baker's on here. He tried to get this statue over at the Sebastian River, but this is out the Kissimmee Prairie Preserve where some of the last Carolina parakeet eggs were. And this is called the Lost Bird Project. And, and Todd McGrain, who did this project, he made five of these statues of extinct birds and put them the last place they were seen. So the Carolina parakeets here in Florida to Kissimmee Prairie, um, the Heath Hen is on Martha's Vineyard, the Labrador Ducks in New York, Passenger Pigeon in Michigan, and uh, Auk um, on somewhere near Nova Scotia. And they also just recently commissioned the Eskimo Curlew for Texas. And, and, and Todd's logo is because forgetting is a second extinction. So um, this is really a, a fitting tribute. He's got duplicates of these that are in traveling um, thing. And, and anyway, if you go to Kissimmee Prairie, this is something to see. Okay, so here's Chapman's handbook for the birds. And this is this is a book that was portable that you could carry. It was one of the very first field guides. And it was very, very popular, 1895. And notice how you figure out what a bird is. Now, how do you get that good of a look at their feet? You shoot them. So even when they would go bird watching, they would shoot the birds. And again, this was wearing on a lot of people's sensitivities and saying, you know, you guys go out to observe birds and you, all you do is shoot them. And so here's one of the very first field guides that actually has pictures of birds. And it's kind of in the Northern pattern. Um, and, um, and, and this was in recognition that maybe we should just start watching them and we don't have to shoot them every time we see them. And remember I told you about the hyper taxonomy? Look at this, Florida yellowthroat, Pacific yellowthroat, Northern yellowthroat, salt marsh yellowthroat, blend, melding yellowthroat, Rio Grande yellowthroat. So, anyway, um, but, but there was a growing awareness that we should stop treating birds this way. And so women again, uh, Florence Miriam and Mabel Osgood Wright, uh, they were writing books about birds and, and birds through an opera class. Let's watch them. And remember I told you about Seahart Miriam, the guy who, who hired all the army surgeons, Florence was his younger sister. And so she was very uh, natural history involved. And Mabel Osgood Wright, um, they were some of the first people elected to be fellows of the American Ornithological Society or Union back then, um, because they were putting out stuff to try to raise awareness of birds. And again, women were very shunted aside back then, but they were still fighting to, to be in the spotlight and to help. And recently, I've learned about George Smith Sutton, and this is from a, 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 a book called At a Bend in the Mexican River, and look at what his inscription was. Unlike Wilson and, and Audubon, it's not drawn from nature, it's direct from life. So apparently he didn't kill this tiger heron to be able to illustrate it. And so after all this work, you know, we got laws passed in 1900. They weren't being enforced. We hired wardens to try to enforce them. And some of those guys got killed. But, but once we started getting enforcement and laws in the book, the, the, the plume birds of the Everglades actually started recovering. And by the 1940s, there were actually uh, colonies that were nesting in the Everglades that some people estimated were in the hundreds of thousands. So once we stopped the, the wholesale slaughter, they actually started doing better. And so this is Howell's Florida Bird Life. And he says, the long and unremitting but finally triumphant struggle of the National Association of Audubon for the rescue from extinction of the plume birds of Florida presents a record probable, probably unparalleled in the animals, <laughs> sorry, in the animals of conservation in this or any other country. No organization has ever encountered more disappointments and more bitter discouragement in its efforts, and none has ever overcome them with a more splendid success. It is an interesting and inspiring story of devotion, devotion to a worthy cause and the power of grim determination. And you think about him writing this in the 1930s, and you think about people back in the 1880s talking about, we're really screwing up. And this is 50 years later. And so frequently we work on issues and I'm going to get into some of those issues we're working on now. And you think, man, we're never going to get anywhere. But this stuff takes a long time. It takes generations. And so um, this kind of helps inspire me when I'm sitting there wondering when SERP's ever going to get built or all these things like that, um, that keep at it. We, you make progress over time. So here's me in 1938. <laughs> And this is, this is Marvin Chandler. He's our very first Audubon warden. And uh, here's his badge. And well, this is another warden's badge. I don't have Marvin's, but there's the badge right on his belt. 
And what he's holding is a water moccasin. They were photographing glossy ibises on Lake Okeechobee. And back then we think 95, 90% of all the glossy ibis nests that we knew of were on Lake Okeechobee on King's Bar. So part of Marvin's job was to keep an eye on them. And he had the Crookshanks with him, which were early Audubon photographers, and they couldn't get around this water moccasin, which is five feet and 11 inches long. And see how fat it is? So when they opened it up, um, it had a glossy ibis egg. It had three tricolored heron eggs. It had another semi-digested egg. They couldn't tell what it was. It had a baby American egret and an adult glossy ibis in it. So they're fun to play with. But anyway, so back in 1936, when we first hired Marvin to start patrolling um, Okeechobee, uh, we, we'd already hired people over in the Tampa Bay region two years earlier. Uh, the Tavernier Center that Jerry Lorenz is the head of was founded about this time. And the governor and cabinet designated these parts of the Lake Okeechobee Marsh as sanctuaries that Audubon could help manage. And they did that to try to make it more legitimate for Marvin to go out there and enforce game laws, because I just cannot imagine trying to enforce game laws in Lake Okeechobee in the 1930s. <laughs> And, and we were getting very, we were getting different rookeries and protecting them. So not only we were having wardens, but we also were getting places designated and, and trying to establish protection for those birds. And here's uh, their travel vehicle. I have an airboat now, <laughs> which is a lot easier to get around in. Um, here's Crookshank and there's Marvin and, and that's uh, James Boney, the, uh, another local. And nowadays, you know, glossy ibises are everywhere in the interior. I drive around, I see them all the time. You know, there's there's thousands of them and people don't realize that we were down to maybe 1,500 of them back in the 1930s. Again, progress that sometimes we forget we had. And when these were designated, they got a letter from five citizens of Okeechobee and they said, we value the business which society brings to our community. And so even if you go to Okeechobee now, you're going to notice it's a cow town. Think about it in the 1930s. But Marvin Chandler was from the Chandler family. They're one of the founding families of the county. And so we were hiring locals. And, and he said, you know, I don't arrest anybody for shooting food for their family. But if someone's out there just being a game hog or just massacring things for the fun of it, you know, those are the guys I arrest. And so very much fitting in with the community and, and, and having support. And here's Marvin. <laughs> Uh, up in Bassinger along the Kissimmee River, and he's looking at this bucket, and here's what's inside the bucket. So why are all these bird eggs in this bucket? And it has to do with Charles Doe. And here's Doe, and he was an early uh, egg collector, and he was from Gainesville, and so the Chandlers didn't like him coming by, and what he would do is he'd go by and he'd tell people, you know, you bring in bird eggs and and, and keep them here. And when I get down here, I'll pay you for them. And what happened is he apparently got crossways with somebody and, and they offered to kill him if he ever came back. And so he quit coming around and that's when someone told him about the eggs out in back of the, the Bassinger store. And, and Marvin went out and found them. But um, here's Rod Chandler, Marvin's nephew, who was a warden in the 60s and 70s. And he's looking up his cabbage palm tree and look at these. It's a ladder. And we think it was Doe's ladder. And so there's Caracara nest in this tree. And so Marvin and, and his successors would, would try to get up the tree and stamp the eggs property of the National Audubon Society. So Doe couldn't steal them and put them in his collection. So this was going on all around us. And some of the big collectors were, were the Nicholson brothers and they were actually pretty good uh, ornithologists, but they also were kind of in that one foot in the collection business. And so, um, that was kind of, again, kind of a mixed bag for what the ornithologists were doing. Here's Marvin's research vehicle, four wheel. Okay, so Marvin died of tuberculosis and his nephew, Glenn, took over and worked for about 17 years. And Glenn did the same stuff. He patrolled. Um, he and Sam Grimes found the first cattle egret nest on Lake Okeechobee in 1953. And this is a, a drawing by Roger Torrey Peterson. And he came to Lake Okeechobee in 1950s. And so I was really anxious to read his account of Lake Okeechobee because I wanted to hear what it looked like, you know, before we did all the stuff we've done. And all he could write about was how beautiful it was to see a cattle egret on a nest in Lake Okeechobee. And his whole chapter was about cattle egrets nesting and being around the area. And so, of course, they were a new arrival. We were not completely sure how they got to the Americas. But anyway, now they're all over the country. But Roger Torrey Peterson spent all the time writing about cattle eaters. So anyway. So then when 
Glenn retired, Rod, his brother took over. And this is Rod uh, with, with Noel, Noel Snyder, uh, who wrote the Carolina parakeet book, but he was here working on snail kites and they were looking for Carolina parakeets in the Fort Drum Swamp. And if you look at a lot of the planning for Kissimmee River restoration, here's Lake Okeechobee and here's the area of the restored river. Um, these pink things are old rookeries that, that the Audubon wardens, that the Chandlers would, would protect. And back then, you know, the, this was really wild country and there were cow camps out there. And so they'd go by and talk to all the cowboys and say, hey, you know, if you see anybody poking around, you know, run them out of here or let me know. And the landowners let the Audubon wardens get on there because they were deputized people. And so it helped kept, keep up with cattle rustling and other kinds of mischief that could go on. And the cattle rustling apparently was so bad I heard that even the honest people had to steal a few to keep their herd numbers up. But anyway, so when they're doing Kissimmee River restoration, you know, they went back to the old Audubon notes. And, and this right here is the Audubon Lord Way would tell Kissimmee Prairie Sanctuary, which I was hired to manage. And notice how many nesting colonies were on there. And that's why when Rod got Audubon to buy the sanctuary, that's that's what, why it ended up where it was, because it had great big basin marshes and, and a lot of resources on it. And here's the dry prairie. Um, it's a really bizarre ecosystem. This big broad thing is an oak tree. It's called a runner oak. And because if you pull up any one of those stems, it's hooked the next one and the next one, the next one. And so we're used to oak trees growing up out of the ground and then branching out to, into a big crown. Well, when you're in a community that burns every couple of years, you can't do that, It'll, you'll get killed. And so this tree branches out under the ground and spreads, sends up, uh, expendable stem and they have just as many acorns as a tall tree um they're they're very very large we don't know how large these get some people think some of the sand chinnery oaks out west um will cover more than one square mile one single tree and in that sense it would be thousands of years old and the palmettos these big clumps of palmettos um archibald estimates they may be five or ten thousand years old so here's an old growth ecosystem and you know these clumps of grass can be 100 years old but it's just short and we haven't recognized that so this is like a really unique ecosystem and here it is from the air very flat the water would land in it and it'd fill up and you know this is all a big wetland complex and just like the everglades it would be completely flooded in the summer and then slowly dry, dry down during the dry season and that's when those waiting birds would be nesting out here so this is kind of like everglades north um and then there's there's five subspecies of birds, and this is part of the reason the Chandlers and Audubon were here. We have the Florida Sandhill Crane, and they nest here. They live their whole life here. Um, we have the migratory cranes from the Great Lakes region uh, come down, but, but these guys stay. Here's some little colts. Uh, we have the mottled duck. They're here, and they're in Texas and Louisiana, but they're not in between. Um, we have burrowing owls. They also are here, and they stay here, and we have burrowing owls out west, but not in between. Same, same story with Caracaras. And then of course the star of the show, the Florida grasshopper sparrow. And part of the reason we have these endemic prairie birds is back during the ice age, there was um, a, a grassland savanna from here to Texas. Remember the ocean was way lower. The peninsula of Florida was twice as wide because the Gulf was, you know, I don't know how far out the shoreline was, hundred miles, um, but we had this grassland. And so these birds were connected to Western grassland birds. But when the oceans went up, um, now we have Mississippi and Alabama and you know Louisiana, and they're all forested. So, so we have this isolated pocket of grassland birds who kind of changed a little bit from, from when they last got isolated, and they're here, and they're unique Florida birds. And so um, Rod Chandler, as I mentioned, got Audubon to buy the, the, the sanctuary, and part of the money, it was the Ordway Hotel, was Catherine Ordway. She loved prairies, and the first guy who really ran Nature Conservancy was Dick Poe, and Dick had worked for Audubon, and Dick was actually there um, when Edwin Way Teal was, was going out to look at the Glossy Ibises back in the 18, 1930s, and so Dick had been on Okeechobee, he'd gone out with the Chandlers, he knew all about it. Um, when it came time to buy the sanctuary, Nat Reed um, knew Dick and knew the prairie and knew the Chandlers, and so, you know, he got Dick to, to get, pitch in some of the Ordway money, and um, we got a, another bequest from another foundation and we were able to buy the sanctuary. And that was the first time anybody had ever bought dry prairie for the purpose of saving dry prairie. That was in 1980. And Dick was still alive when we did it. 
And after we bought the the big track, the Kissimmee, we bought the Kissimmee Prairie Preserve next, and it was 50,000 acres, and our sanctuary is only 7,000, so we sold our sanctuary to become part of the preserve, which it is now. But we wrote a letter to Dick and said, hey, man, you know, you bought this place for us, but now we've got a 50,000 acre preserve. And is it okay if we sell this and it becomes part of the preserve? And, and he writes this letter. He says, I will feel good that I will feel that Good Hills Grant was the key to what is now a 50,000 acre preserve. And it was. Um, it was that early work by Audubon people to position us when the biggest remaining track to dry prairie came available, we were able to get it. And that was in cooperation with water management and other people, Nature Conservancy. But, you know, really, really exciting stuff. And it's kind of Audubon beginning work. And so here's a map of the conservation holdings. When I started, this was the old Audubon Sanctuary. We next bought the, this big Kissimmee Prairie Preserve. The border used to be along here. We just got the Corrigan Tract last year. This has a whole bunch of grasshopper sparrows on it. Um, this is a conservation easement. We just got the Triple Diamond Ranch, and, and so it's been added onto it. Uh, here's the DeLuca Preserve up here. Um, the Adams Ranch sold a big easement. And so what 30 years ago was only, this was the only conservation land here. Um, now look at all the conservation land we have. And so this is, um, for all the other problems we have in the world, we're really happy to have this stuff squared away. And even the Air Force range across the river, their border used to be there and they sold easements too. So again, it's through the work of conservation people who are in the interior and trying to patch stuff together that we've actually got pretty good holdings. And we're trying to connect the St. This is the Kissimmee Valley. This is St. John's. Notice we're only a few miles apart. This is about five miles. So we're trying to figure out how to get a connector in there and, and follow this corridor concept. But um, this is just really exciting stuff that we've been able to conserve this much land in the interior. And as Florida becomes increasingly urbanized, this is going to be so important in the future. So back to Okeechobee. Here's the marsh when things are going good. Here's the snail kite out there enjoying its day. And of course, Mac takes great snail kite photos. He went out with us and he actually staged this snail and, and put out his camera trap and waited for days and finally got these dazzling photos. Notice how long and skinny their toes are. That's how you hold on to a big round object. And Okeechobee's habitat for not just um, aquatic birds, it's, 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 you know, these are all neotropical migrants. These are all the little bug eating birds that, that go across the Gulf of Mexico. And when they get to Florida, they gotta make, they gotta fuel up to get across. And here's some more. These were all banded by Tyler Beck of FWC out on Lake Okeechobee on some islands out there. And all these little guys are in migration. And a couple of them he caught two years in a row in the same month. And because they're just like us, they're, if you go to a town and you find a good restaurant, when you go back, you go back to that restaurant. So they apparently got what they needed on the lake and, and they came back. And if you look at this leaf, these are midges. Uh, the locals call them chizzy winks, um, but they're blind mosquitoes, another name. And if, if birds get here and our marshes do this, um, they can eat a whole bunch of stuff and get really fat and fly across the Gulf of Mexico. And they, they do, they double their body weight and they burn that fat while they fly, which is something we cannot do. And of course, you know, when they take off, that fat is a gas tank. And, and if they don't have enough gas, they don't make it. So our position is extraordinarily important to those birds. And we like birds because they're pretty and they sing, but they actually took some, some trees in Missouri and put tents over them that the birds couldn't get into. And then right next to them in the forest, they didn't have tents. And basically the, the open forest trees were losing about 13% of their leaves to caterpillars and bugs. And the ones inside the tent were losing 25%. And it was significantly slowing down their growth. And this type of an experiment has been replicated all around the world with, with very similar results. It's startling how much impact birds have on bug populations and how much they help plants grow. And so, you know, you may not know it, but if you're a forester in Pennsylvania or Nova Scotia, you care if these birds come back and you care if the Everglades is restored. Because if it's not, if Okeechobee is not healthy, these birds may not make it. And again, look at, look at our position. We're the neck of a funnel. And, you know, not everybody goes through Florida, but I heard 2 billion birds go across the Gulf of Mexico and we're a really important cog. So acre for acre, we are extraordinarily important to migrating birds. And so, you know, we're saving the Everglades because we love the Everglades, but we need to save the Everglades because we're protecting North and South American birds. 
also, by the way, North America has more migratory birds um, than any other continent as percent of species. So again, resident birds are great, but migratory birds are really important. And us being Audubon, we think about that. And so here's a, a thing about where places are really important. And once again, look at how dark Florida is. They're really important in both spring and fall for migratory birds. Um, and this is from eBird, this is from uh, Cornell, I think. But again, we're really important. And so here we are really important, but here we here's what we've done to our state. It's all buggered up. You can see all these compartments. This is the EAA. This is a big citrus grove going in. Um, here's our plumbing system. And so it has made life in Florida what we know it today. And there have been a lot of good things that came from our projects, but also, as we all know, a lot of environmental problems have arisen that we need to try to fix. And so when the Everglades originally functioned, all this water would come out of the Kissimmee Valley, it would overflow the rim of the Everglades, and we'd have this big, beautiful river grass, and you know, we all know about that. But when we had the big hurricanes, we asked the Corps to help us train the state. The engineers are like, well, should I send water 100 miles to Florida Bay with only a 20-foot gradient, or do I send it 35 miles to the St. Lucie? Well, engineering-wise, that's the, the logical solution. And so they started sending water east and west, not bothering with this circuit, and the Everglades no longer gets enough water. And these estuaries, as I think everybody knows, get way too much water, and everybody's mad. And after we dumped the water, after the 2004 and 5 hurricanes, we dumped enough water out of the lake to meet all the agricultural needs around the lake for six years. But the next year, we got into a drought, and they were being rationed 50% of what they wanted. And it's not because we don't get enough water, so we're wasting it. And so Everglades Restoration is supported by everybody because the estuary people don't want the big dumps. We don't want Okeechobee too deep and too shallow. The farmers want a more predictable supply of water. The cities do too. And so Everglades Restoration is gonna be about trying to catch water north, south, east, and west around the lake when it's plentiful. And then if we can catch it in a beneficial way, we don't have to emergency dump it and then try to route it back to the Everglades so the Everglades would be better. I mean, in a nutshell, that's what we're trying to do is catch the water and send it south. And of course, we have water quality problems. Here's Lake Okeechobee blowing up in a big, massive cyanobacteria bloom because we polluted the lake. We need to clean up the water. We can't just send the water back to the Everglades if it's not clean. It will cause problems there like it causes problems in Okeechobee. And so here's signs. This is from Lee County and Caloosahatchee. This is from Martin County, the St. Lucie. And you know, if you're the Chamber of Commerce, you don't want a sign on your boat ramp saying, don't touch the water, it might kill you. Um, because we're, we're water, we're Florida, and people come here to go swimming and fishing and kayaking and, and enjoying the, our water resources. And so it's really important that we change this trajectory and start cleaning up. And, and by the way, you know, when we drain the Everglades, the, the wading birds have really rebounded very strongly. But then when we drained it, now we still have half the wetlands, but we have, quote unquote, we've lost 90% of the birds. And the reason the last 50% of the Everglades only supports 10% of the numbers is because the hydrology is all messed up because of all these changes. And so if we can change it back to closer to what it used to be, we can get back the numbers again. And if you think about it, you know, so the first half of the 1900s, it was over harvest and we, we got that fixed, but now it's bad water management and human impacts. And so we got to work on that. And so, you know, here's what I deal with these jokes and I get it, you know, it's kind of, but, you know, this is also this, this dazzling lake and um, it, it just hurts my feelings when people don't really realize it just has so much value. And these are crappie fishermen. This is some of the SAV in the lake. And you notice how beautifully clear the water is when those plants can grow, they clean the water. And so we can have a healthy Lake Okeechobee that supports all kinds of bird life and a healthy Everglades, but that's what we're working on now. And that's what takes so long. And that's why I had that 50 year reference of how long it took to stop the plume birds. Now we got way more people. It's, it's just, it's, it's a long-term project. So we need to figure ways to store water outside a lake. We need to be able to clean it. If you have it in a reservoir, you can run it through a filter marsh before it goes anywhere. And so we can clean it. And then once we have it under better control, we can convey more of it to the Everglades where it's needed and quit dumping it in the estuaries where it's not. And so there's a big Caloosahatchee Reservoir, the C-43. There's a big C-44 Reservoir. This one's done. This one's under construction right now. 
There's the EAA reservoir. It is getting going right now. It's been very accelerated by a lot of recent political developments. We're trying to figure out what to do north of the lake to try to stop all the water from glugging into it too fast. That's been difficult, but we're still working on it. And the Corps and the district are really sincerely trying to figure out how we can slow the flow up here so the system stays more manageable. The Kissimmee River ditch. And here's the old ditch. And here's a floodplain. And this was done for ecological purposes, but you notice something about this water? It's all spread out. It's not going fast. It's getting cleaned. It's creating habitat. So trying to go back and rehydrate the Okeechobee watershed to the extent we can is really one of our major goals. And, and we're gonna build reservoirs because we can't restore everything and we're still gonna have water needs, but to the extent we can, this is the kind of restoration that I would like to see upstream of the lake. And if you build it, they do come. And so we also have to work with private landowners. Obviously, if a drop of water lands in here, it, it gets kicked out. Um, if a wading bird goes here, I mean, they might be able to, to eat something in that little ditch, but you know, this is not a habitat for them. And so now when we do major developments, we try to protect wetlands and we still are growing a lot of food for people um, and in places that are more suitable, but we don't just annihilate everything. So to the extent we can, let's be more friendly to our, our, our state. And this is a cattle ranch. Obviously, there's a lot of value here. Um, we're, we're trying to work with cattle ranchers and pay them to store water in their property. And, you know, because if you're going to spend money to build a reservoir, then why not pay these guys to help? And when the water lands on their property, it just sits there and, and the birds can love it. This is only uh, two miles from my office, so I go by there all the time because it's a pretty cool little pond. And here's Alapata Flats. Um, this is up in Martin County, and this is the drained area. And they plug the ditches. And so when it rains, this water's not glugging into the Indian River Lagoon. It's just sitting there. And we don't have to turn on pumps to get it to sit there. It's creating habitat. And so, again, to the extent we can do natural restoration and rehydration, that's what Audubon is really pushing for, and a lot of people. Um, and, um, and so it's not the total solution, but it's one of those things that we can do to try to do. And again, you know, I'm trying to do this for birds, but it's also helping fix our human water problems. And so I'll, I'll wrap it up, um, but Rod Chandler was a complete cracker and uh, his writing was so eloquent. And so this is something I found in one of his notes. He goes, I know one thing for sure. I'm always closer to God while checking the Everglades kites with the airboat than most any other time. And I'm also thankful to him when I get back to the landing. And the reason he said that is he talked about how um, unreliable airboats are. And if you break down, especially in the water conservation areas, you can sit there a long time before anybody can come by and help you. So anyway, thanks to Rod and thanks to Audubon and all the people who came before us, uh, I get to do this work. So I'll stop talking and um, if we have time for questions and stuff, I'll be happy to, to, to talk. If you, can you stop sharing your screen, Paul? That was awesome, thank you. I'm no willing, no longer sharing. <laughs> yeah, yay. Um, so, uh, that was great. Thanks so much. Um, there are some, uh, there are a few questions, you know, you mostly got, um, accolades here. <laughs> so, uh, you should look in the chat because there are some awesome, um, comments on, on what you're saying, but, uh, a really good question was, hold on. I got to scroll back up all of the congratulations. Um, uh, we've got a question from Rhonda who wants to know what insight does this history of hunting give you into our current obsession with hunting? And she says that many organizations and agencies represent hunters primarily, even though the disparity between human and wildlife populations has never been greater. Uh, could you read the first part of that again? First I, I part of it again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, wait, I just go, ah, sorry. Why, I just, is, why is Autumn being spotlighted now? I don't understand. I'm, you might have it on so that like the talker is well, spotlighted. Well, oh, just about hunting in general. Um, yeah. You know, I grew up fishing and hunting as a kid in the Midwest. And so it's just kind of a normal activity. And, you know, the way we do it now is actually pretty well managed. Um, you know, we've been hunting for 
a hundred years and, and the things that we hunt, we manage their populations, we count them and we adjust hunting regulations if their numbers get low or something comes up. Not perfect by any means. Um, we've especially had a lot of problems in our fisheries with harvesting them and, and they're harder to sample than, than animals that are you know visible. Um, but it's one of those things that the hunters and fishermen are a constituency too and they love what they do and they love the resource. They don't always, sometimes their their hobby is more important than the resource, but um, I consider them allies when I'm not arguing with them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, I don't know if, um, if Scott, you, because uh, what everyone said, oh, here, here we go. Um, Paul, this is from Mark Cook. He wants to know, what are your thoughts on how we best clean the lake's legacy nutrients? Okay, thanks, Mark. <laughs> um, so what legacy nutrients are is um, the stuff we've already put out. So for example, uh, the Buck Island Ranch, which is run by Archibald Biological Station, they have not used phosphorus fertilizer for like 30 years. And back in the 50s and 60s, they put out a lot of phosphorus before they owned it um, because the recommendation from the ag people was, was you need phosphorus to grow grass. And they were putting out 25 to 40 pounds an acre a year. Um, and they did that for decades. And so each acre probably had like maybe 500 pounds of phosphorus put on it. And then they did some research and found out, well, you know what? The phosphorus doesn't help you. There's actually more phosphorus in the soil than we thought. And they did some trials where they had no fertilizer and low, medium, and high, and they all grew the same. And so they said, okay, save your time, save your money, don't use phosphorus. So good. They, they more or less stopped applying phosphorus fertilizer. But, but there's 500 pounds of legacy in that acre. And for Okeechobee to meet its phosphorus goal, it needs one-tenth of one pound per acre, not 500, one-tenth of one pound. And so then we're like, okay, well, is this stuff going to leach out of the soil and we'll get back down closer to what we want? And the answer has been no. There's so much that even decades later, Buck Island still has about the same phosphorus runoff as it did 30 years ago. And so that means we can't just sit there and let it leach out and then it'll get better and better every year. As a matter of fact, they did a background study and they, they said, we're probably going to have these big phosphorus loads for at least 20 to 50 more years. And so we're going to have to clean that water before it goes in the lake. And that's going to take some kind of public works projects, whether it's stormwater treatment areas or, or what. We actually don't really know yet. And so that's been a big problem is we know we have a big problem, but we don't have a real clear way to fix it. And again, I think part of it is that awareness. Um, we still don't treat pollution. Like if you go out and shoot a bird right now in your front yard, someone's going to call a wildlife officer. They're going to come arrest you. You're going to go to court. You're going to get punished because it's not socially acceptable. But pollution is still socially acceptable. The, we have people who are, are adding nutrients to their property, causing massive pollution problems. They're dumping biosolids in their property, causing massive pollution problems. And we haven't had the public outrage that says that's not acceptable. You're, you're going to be a pariah if you do that. And that's part of that 50 year. We've got to make pollution uncool. And anybody who does it should be embarrassed and should be working very hard to fix it. But we're not there yet. And that's, again, what that's what these long term problems have is you have to have a lot of discussion and, and, and get there. And we're just not there yet. And that's that's been a big frustration for me because I've been banging my head on the wall for 30 years, but we'll keep trying. Great. Um, and we do have to make pollution on cold. Um, <laughs> I love that. Um, so I have two, um, two more questions and I'm gonna turn it over to Scott. Um, I think that there is maybe one more after that. Um, but um, one of them is, uh, what's the population of the grasshopper sparrow at the Kissimmee Preserve? Has it grown since the land was purchased? Um, yeah, I have a whole different talk on grasshoppers. Um, actually, they had a really big population when we first got the preserve, and they crashed. And they also crashed on Avon Park, and they crashed at Three Lakes. And those were the three big populations. So we went from hundreds and hundreds of grasshopper sparrows down to about like maybe 50 singing males we knew of. And we don't know the cause. We think it was probably a disease that went through the population. Um, we've started a captive breeding program and it has been very, very successful. It was kind of hard to get going because no one knew how to do it, but they have been releasing birds at Three Lakes Wildlife Management Area, which is FWC. And their population of birds in the wild was about 
25 singing males and now they're up over 50. Um, and they've released some at uh, Avon Park Air Force Range and they were, they were almost gone from there. And last year they had like 20 some singing males and we're just now starting surveys. So we think there'll be more this year. But anyway, so we're restocking them and they seem to be doing well. And um, so I think the future is bright for grasshoppers because we have a ton of habitat for them, but we just got to get them back out in the landscape and make sure they're self-sustaining. Cool. Um, so also uh, same area, um, you mentioned, this is from Natasha, that you mentioned that um, the land that's managed by the Audubon is adjacent to the Air Force Base. So do you coordinate with them to help them manage their land for wildlife? Yeah, so our old sanctuary was adjacent to the preserve, but they bought our sanctuary and now the state owns it and we do not manage it. But Kissimmee Prairie is right across the river from Avon Park. And with the Grasshopper Sparrow Working Group, we, and, and also Three Lakes Wildlife Management, they're FWC. So there's three different entities that are managing grasshopper sparrow habitat. And so that's what the working group was formed. And so all of us would get together and learn what other people were working on, what they were learning, um, how to standardize our techniques. And so that is a really constructive group of professionals who are managers and researchers and and from different agencies and universities. And, and again, were it not for that working group, I'm not sure the captive breeding program could have been established and gotten us as far as we have. And we're still working on it, but things are looking better rather than worse every year. Cool, great. Um, so this is, I believe, the very last question we have. And like I said, I encourage you to read the comments because they're amazing. Um, so, but, so, uh, so yeah. Autumn, I know, I know you have to go. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. And uh, uh, let me, there's a, there is a, one or two more questions, uh, Paul, that I, that I do want to ask. One is from uh, Nat Natasha, and she asks, uh, where is it? I'm sorry, I just had it in front of me. Uh, you mentioned that some of the land that is managed by Audubon and Kissimmee is adjacent to an Air Force base. Do you coordinate with them to help them manage their land for wildlife? Yes, and that's the Avon Park Air Force Range. And again, they're across the river from the Kissimmee Prairie Preserve. They have the same types of habitat. They've also got some scrub, but yeah, they we all work very closely together. We all talk about how often we burn and when we burn, and and they have some constraints because they are a bombing range, and so they can't always go out and um, do stuff. And they have a lot of fires that are related to the range activities, but but they actually do a pretty good job with their their place. And and again, all the all the places that have grasshopper sparrows work really closely with each other. That's that's great, and it's so great that you are working in cooperation with them. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's another question about the corridors. Um, and by the way, uh, Richard Baker says great comprehensive presentation. Uh, so the the connecting the corridors and and are are the lands you would like that should be bought to connect? Are there lands that you should be bought to connect all 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 of the all of the uh, wetlands there? Uh, are there more lands that need to be uh, purchased for that? I think that's the, that's what the question is. And which species needs more attention to protect now? Um, yes, there are more more lands that are needed. Um, like I mentioned, that we want to connect the St. John's headwaters to the Kissimmee Valley, and we can do that near Yeehaw Junction, where that Deluca Preserve is. Um, but there's a whole lot of places that are in the corridor and along the corridor that not only function as corridor, but they're also water resource places, and they're um, just they have unique values of their own. So the corridor is a very good framework to look at a lot of this conservation work and show us where, you know, even though we have a lot of land acquired, it's not in a perfect pattern. And that's part of what the corridor helps do is patch it together into a more functional conservation pattern. And, you know, we think about panthers and bears moving along corridors, but plants can do that too. Um, lots of animals can use them and the connectivity is, is really important. Yeah, and I, I I know there is work being done to purchase more land in in, in the corridors in um, in Central Florida, which I know are so critical to uh, for wildlife to be able to move between those areas. And you know, hopefully, you know that will that will happen, and the legislature will also um, put some put some dollars that way as well. Uh, there's a, there's a question. I it's not, I think it's more of a statement than a question. Regarding hunting, this is by Ann Wiley, uh, waterfall numbers have steadily risen over the past hundred years, absolutely due to waterfowl hunters, ducks unlimited and duck stamps. Uh, hunters can be very good conservationists. Do you agree? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the hunting community has 
been very active in trying to preserve these these birds um, or whatever they hunt because it's in their interest to do so. So, um, you know, sometimes there's conflicts between hunters and non-hunters over use, um, and you got to manage that kind of stuff. And but but hunters are again they're a very valuable ally uh, in our conservation work. That's that's great. I'm I'm glad that. Um... And I know that there's, you know, there's always some controversy regarding hunting, and particularly when, for for people who love wildlife and bird lovers. But they, I, I know the duck stand program has been very beneficial in terms of ducks. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Cook has another question. Uh, hopefully, this won't be as complicated as the last one for you. Uh, what was the species of the underground prairie oak? I can only imagine how important uh, that is to the ecological integrity of the prairie. I'll have to go and check that out. Okay, there's two kinds of them, and I'm. No, just enough botany to be dangerous, but it's Quercus pumilla, P-U-M-I-L-A, and Quercus minima. And um, and if you don't burn them, they will grow 20 feet tall. Uh, but again, in a in a properly burned habitat, they they run under the ground and they're just another prairie species. And it, it, again, the prairie is just acre for acre, that place has more plant species than anywhere in North America. And there's some people that think some of their areas may be higher, but anyway, they're in the top, whatever. That's great. Uh, one last question that I have actually, uh, you, you brought up before about the fact that uh, generals and, and ornithologists uh, would often name birds after themselves or after, after their friends. So I know that you, I think you mentioned there's a movement right now to consider that, that aspect. So I know how hard it's been for me just to change from common gallinal to, you know, to, I mean, from uh, common moorhen to common gallinal, from a, a purple swamp hen to gray-headed swamp hen. So there are uh, quite a few birds that bear the names of people. So what are your thoughts? Uh, is this something that should be done all at once? Um, is it something that you think should be done slowly where we take, where we change the names to be more specific to, to what the species perhaps looks like? Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Paul? <laughs> it's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I I think there's a lot of merit in in talking about how they were named because like Lucy's warbler was named after somebody's daughter and and some of the names are kind of goofy um, and I, I don't mind up, upgrading names. Um, but then again, on the other side of the coin, you know, obviously I have a lot of respect for Alexander Wilson and I'm happy he's been commemorated. And so I wouldn't want to lose all of them either. So but I think on a case by case basis, it's worth looking at and saying, is this the type of person that should should get that remembrance from? Right. Yeah. So that's a it's a legitimate conversation. And you know, Audubon's been having it ourselves and it's been hard for people. So basically you're saying it should be really a case by case basis on the names. Yeah, in my opinion. And again, you know, I'm not a taxonomist, so that's for their people to discuss. So I just want to share with you some of the accolades uh, that because uh, there was, there were so many. Uh, I'm trying to get back to where they first started. Uh, Kathy Ombach, wonderful presentation. I've learned so much. I was particularly interested in the Kissimmee Prairie portion of the talk. Um, uh, uh, Teresa Beerman, thank you so much. So informative. Uh, Jenny Donahue, fantastic presentation, Dr. Gray. Uh, Susan Coppola, wonderful, such a great storyteller. Uh, which you are, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, 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 Fredel and Evans, great program. Sabina Begg, great presentation, very informative. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Um, uh, Shelley Rosenberg, wonderful presentation and illustrations. Thank you. And Bassett Hike, thank you for a fascinating and well thought out presentation. Um, Mark Cook, also excellent presentation. This was a wonderful history lesson. I agree, particularly that information on the on the on how those phrases came from, from the flintlock. That was like amazing. I, you know, cause I, as a former literature teacher, I'm familiar with the ones from Shakespeare, but I had no idea of these from the flintlock. That was, that was, that was fascinating. Uh, Rose Law, uh, each time I hear you speak, I learned so much. Thank you so very much. I already look forward to the next time. Um, Shelly, by the way, mentioned, I, I was so fortunate to see the grasshopper sparrow at Three Lakes. So that's, that's wonderful. Jeannie Mauser, I learned so much. Uh, thank you. And um, uh, Sabina Begg, thank you, everyone. If you would like to watch Dr. Gray's excellent presentation, it will be available on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Paul, thank you so much for coming tonight and staying so late with us. I know this was a late evening, but you didn't have to make the drive over. So that, I guess, made it a little, because <laughs> I know you would drive in, do the presentation and drive back. And I don't know how you did it, because I know it's a two-hour drive for you. 
So uh, uh, thank you so much, Paul. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thanks and, everybody for tuning in. <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks again. And, and we can't wait to have you again. Thank you, Paul. So um, I just wanted to uh, uh, thank everybody for coming tonight. Remember, uh, next month we will have Dr. Tiffany Troxler, uh, who will be joining us uh, virtually and informing us on the transformation towards a sustainable, resilient South Florida. Uh, in fact, that whole evening is going to be about resiliency, climate change, what we can do, what Audubon Florida is doing. And then we're going to have a wonderful uh, short presentation from one of our young Audubon Everglades members. Uh, and I know you're all going to be excited about that. So see you next month. Have a wonderful month birding. It's we're, get, we're getting kind of close to the end of our birding season here. So take advantage of it and uh, and uh, hope to see some of you out there, perhaps on my field trip on that I'll be leading on, on Saturday. Thank you and have a great night, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Gray. This is Sabina. Hopefully we can get you down here next time. In yeah. Yeah. Well, and I lead a tour to the prairie and we have a once once every other year. And then the other tours, we go around the Hoover Dyke and talk about the lake and the dyke. And we go from Port Mayaka around to Clewiston. So those are fun tours. Oh, definitely. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I haven't done that. I twice I I wanted to, and then something came up, and I wasn't able to. So I hope, hopefully, I think I guess this year will be our Cluberston tour because this past year was the Prairie tour. Yeah. So, so that, anyway, yeah, that would be exciting. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. Have, have, have a great that evening. That was a great Thank presentation. You. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right, well, I'm going to end the program for tonight. Thanks, everybody, again. And uh, again, see you next month. And uh, it was wonderful being with you tonight.